get in the know. Non-stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Purple Daily, presented by Surly Brewing Company. Looking back on it, you know, maybe could have you know, just been a little bit more, uh, hey, this is kind of where you want the ball to go, but I want Kirk to be able to play. I want him to be free out there to make good decisions. He did all night long, moved our team, stood in there, you know, getting the ball out of his hand in rhythm. It just so happens that that down, you know, we just didn't get enough on the play regardless. And in the end, uh, I look at that as it's as much, uh, if anything, it's on me in that play call. Um, even though we had eligibles with a, with a chance down the field, maybe um, there's always a play that could be better for your guys out there. And, and that one will stick with me. God. Kevin O'Connell does a great job sort of owning things that he could do better as a rookie coach. He's not he's not insecure in that way, right? He's perfectly comfortable saying, right. yeah, I need to learn to do this better or whatever. Right. It's about as half-hearted as he has owned something there, though, right? Ultimately, yes. it's on me with the play design, yes. even though there were some options that we could have attempted to throw the ball to. Right. There's always a better play call. Um, we'll get into <laughs> all of the fourth and eight stuff. We'll get into so Declan. It's Declan's turn to be the pie chart chef today here on Purple Daily. Rock knows how you feel about pie. The last and chef. Um, the what? The last, the last chef last... of the season. He's the last yeah. one. Well, we might in, we might introduce pie charts in other ways throughout the off season sure. too. But in terms of yeah, like a a game a game uh, pie chart. So this is yep. the last pie that we we were out, we're out of ingredients for the season. So Declan will. Cobbled together the last ingredients in the kitchen. This is Purple Daily, Daily Vikings Entertainment, where we just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. And so uh, today is day one of the 2023 season. And it's actually going to be, I know a lot of you are probably just still seething over that loss yesterday, but I think we come in here, we're going to put that game to bed yesterday and do an autopsy on it. But we will start immediately today, even with a bonus episode of Purple Daily, Looking ahead at off-season maneuvers, what can and should be done, what are changes that need to be made. Mm -hmm. So from now until the NFL draft for the next several months, this show will be every single day looking ahead and looking back to just seeing sort of what went right, what went wrong. But uh, we're all about how can they make this thing better now, just so, so you guys know where we're at starting here today. And if you do want to see it, Ventline is a great place to go and watch So, because there's plenty of seething there. So if you're like, why why are you guys so chipper on this Monday? Because the therapist left it all on the couch for two hours yesterday. Yeah, it does help. It does help. It helps you wake up in the morning with a a fresher perspective. Uh, The show is presented by our friends at TCL. Redefine creativity with the TCL 30V 5G smartphone. Enjoy blazing fast 5G speed, an AI-powered 50-megapixel triple camera system. Football. Ultra-realistic and true-to-life visuals powered by Next Vision and booming sound from the dual speakers. Also, our friends at Surly Brewing Company, the official craft beer of Purple Daily, Judd. Oh, yeah. So, I'm um, un- unfortunately, the before-I-die lifestyle, which, by the way, I'm told is going to continue. So I am hearing it's it's far from done. But at least for now, we're going to have to uh, put a pin in that. But that doesn't mean that Surly is putting a pin in the many fantastic beers. Furious, Logic Bomb, Axeman, I could go on that, that they make. And guess what? Those beers can be soothing for a season that ends in disappointment. Surly Brewing, thank you again to our friends at Surly for uh, being a presenting sponsor of this show. Amen. All right, let's start with Judd here. We'll get to Declan's pie chart in a little while, but every single Monday we give you our hottest Vikings takes fresh out of the oven. So, Judd, the floor is yours. What's your hottest Vikings take? Thank you very much. I have been crafting on this one because um, I really wanted to have something. I really wanted to say something about the defense, but obviously the hot take of Ed Donatel has to be fired. First of all, that bullet's been shot, and second of all, it's not a hot take now. So here is my hottest Vikings take involving the defense. And I think if you think this through, it's true. Kevin O'Connell was as negligent with defense as Mike Zimmer was with his offense. Wow. So ultimately, at the end of the day, in his first year as coach, which, to be clear, had a lot of positives. So the O'Connell Crusaders, I'm not saying he didn't do a good job. He got 13 wins. But... Let's think about what let's think about what he saw. Let's think about how things went. 
Let's think about the times that he basically acknowledged we have to fix things. And then let's think about yesterday's game. The negligence that he ended up and the, the deferring that he did to Ed Donatel was inexcusable at the end of the day for a team that was as good as the Vikings. Because the one thing that we all agree on is as maddening as the fourth and eight, eight play was and as costly, what cost this game what cost the team this game was that if you take out the two the end of the half possession and the end of the game possession, the Giants scored on five of seven possessions. Yeah. Defense was the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's to go back to your your take here, for as much as Mike Zimmer got filleted for basically being a, a part-time a full-time defensive coordinator, part-time head coach. Yep. I think after eight years, it just wore on you as a fan, as some of the players, media. It's like, dude, you are the head, the head coach. You know, when Zimmer would Zimmer would pop off to the media about offensive related things or you know how many times did he i actually posted something on twitter a couple days ago you know zimmer multiple times went public with i want kirk to go for the jugular i want kirk to be more aggressive yep. it's like okay so you want him to be more aggressive but you won't meet with him you won't put in you won't put in the time behind the scenes to make that happen and kevin o'connell i guess we don't know as much about what his hour by hour schedule looks like in the building and we do know that he was a little more hands on lately with the defense challenging Ed Donatel a few weeks ago. Hey, as an offensive guy, this is how I would attack your crappy defense. But yeah, he did come in, first-year head coach, ton of things on his plate, and he decided, I'm going to call plays on offense because I've never really gotten a chance to do that. I feel like this is my my shot to, yep. to be a play caller. Um, and I, I think he wanted Mike Pettin and Ed Donatel, just he's much like Zimmer did early on with Norv Turner, Bring in some experienced veteran guys. You guys handle that side of the ball. Keep me in the loop. But this is where sometimes being a play caller might actually be a detriment. If Wes Phillips can be even a, like an equal play caller to Kevin O'Connell. And there's some things to nitpick, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that too, with Kevin O'Connell's play calling. Would it free him up to have just a better view of everything involving the football team? on game day and during the week. That's that's a question that they should address this offseason. Well, and what really gets me, though, is, is like, the Giants are certainly a competent offensive team, but they're not great, okay? And you're going into a one-game season, which the Vikings talked about, okay? If we lose, we're done. And that was your effort? Like, that was your scheme? That was your idea? Um, to me, that is negligence on the head coach's part to after a full season of say of seeing Donna shell swing and miss on ideas or or always sort of revert back to what he believed in would work to have that be your performance to have that be your game plan um if this had been if kevin o'connell was in his fourth or fifth year i think we would absolutely destroy him for that and because he's new and because he's a, a likable dude, which is all great, we sort of are giving him a pass. Like, I'm not hearing anything about his involvement or lack th thereof in a defense. It's not as if Ed Donatel had had this great season, right? Yeah. And you're saying, oh, man, Ed Donatel's done a great job. What? Oh, this is so disappointing. What happened? This was, a, in some ways, a self-fulfilling prophecy of negligence. So, yeah, I am. Um, the more I thought about this, the more I thought, you have to point a finger at O'Connell. And what the hell happened for that to be the approach there? That's your approach? Daniel Jones ran for, you know, you know. I know. O'Connell talked about in his postgame presser. We know Daniel Jones was going to run. You know, Saquon Barkley is not new. Um, and so for you to come out, and, and you can blame the players, but the reality is, you know what you're up against. You know that you have to win. And I don't think asking you to beat the Giants is this huge task. San Francisco, maybe. Not the Giants. At home, correct. Yes, your, your favor, just despite, despite all the reasons why you're a fraud, the market still favored you in that game. Vegas did. All right. Um, I'm, I've been trying to think of the right hot take for this, so I'll throw it out there. I'm just going to say it. The fourth and eight play, Kirk Cousins' decision to check the ball down, fourth and the season, to check the ball down to a covered tight end heading toward the sidelines. 
undid everything good that he did the previous four months. Everything. And here's why I say that. And I get that this is probably like, oh, come on, Phil. The guy tied the record for fourth quarter comebacks. In terms of like fourth quarter analytics, he was the second or third best in the league behind Patrick Mahomes and or a couple other guys, depending on which metrics you look at. How can you say that that one play, and he was largely excellent against the Giants for the you know 95% of that game. How can that one play completely undo everything? Because today on this Monday morning and next week and the week after that, every week leading up to the NFL league year starting and the free agency window opening and contract decisions having to be made, right? Internally, externally, everyone is still asking the same question that they did a year ago and three years ago and five years ago about a Kirk Cousins team. Is he good enough in those big moments against the best teams in the NFL when the pressure is cranked up the most? Can he make the right play? Can he rise above adversity and pressure? And the answer is still a giant shrug emoji talking about these playoff games. The regular season, we saw so many great things from him that we really hadn't seen a lot of before. Some of them trickled in in 2021. But the fact that we are still sitting here, face palm emoji like, oh, wah, wah. Season's on the line. And he decides to throw a safe check down to TJ Hawkinson. And by the way, Kevin Seifert reposted this play this morning on Twitter from ESPN.com to sort of re- to reignite the discussion and the debate. If you watch that play, and and it's I retweeted it on, on my Twitter account, at Phil Mackey, if you want to watch it a hundred times like I have this morning and last night. There is some pressure coming from his left side, but he gets a pretty standard like two and a half or three seconds. The pressure... The pressure did not derail the play. Even he said, my decision to throw it to TJ, first I processed Justin Jefferson's route. I mean, this is him. He's saying, Jefferson was the first read, but he was bracketed. This is kind of a classic classic Vikings trope too, right? Kirk trope. Well, Jefferson was covered. Well, I watched the Buffalo game. I don't know about all you guys. Uh, I saw the Buffalo game where Justin Jefferson reached up with one hand between three defenders and brought that ball down on you know, fourth in the game, he's never covered. If the options are, and I had a PFF, uh, PFF Jackson, I want to say, jump in and say, listen, hey, PFF Jackson, it was a right half of the field read. Jefferson was completely bracketed. Pressure came a little early. So there were two outcomes, take a sack or throw it to Hawkinson. And I say, no, 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 no. Those are not the two options because the third option he moved off of consciously, which is throw it to Jefferson. I would even argue Hawkinson should not be an option if there's a defender on him that short of the sticks. Therefore, KJ would be your second read, and he had a one-on-one matchup coming over the middle, and he was open by a couple steps. Yes. So he, there's really no def- – like you, I guess you could do some mental gymnastics and, def- yeah, and defend it, but yeah. the fact that we're still here asking the same question, boy, can a, can a Kirk Cousins-led team with him making that much money – Go deep in the playoffs. Shrug emoji. It's the same place we've been for five years. So that whole play was so fantastic now to go back and watch because it also is a culmination of a mistake O'Connell made that um, that I guess we should have seen coming eventually. But it was what it was was it, it was the marrying of the fact that Kirk returned to who Kirk is, which is that check down throw, and the fact that, that as... Um, as O'Connell said in, in his presser, you never want that ball to go that short. But the but the question is, okay, when you drew up that route, why was anyone that short? You've got to eliminate that from Kirk. You've got to force him to throw an incompletion. And and to go back to what we have talked about, um, and this is something that goes back to the summer. Kirk Cousins 2022 is a Frankenstein of Kevin O'Connell. This is not Kirk Cousins. Like that fourth and eight play was, but Kirk Cousins' success, which, by the way, included worse statistics for the most part. Kirk Cousins' success is built on this. He was a Frankenstein. He was built by O'Connell. That play against Buffalo, Kirk, the throw to Jefferson, uh, not in a million years does Kirk Cousins make that throw pre-O'Connell, right? 
That was very similar play design, by the way. Yes. It was it was Jefferson and Hawkinson rolling out to yes. the right. Jefferson you, with more depth. Do you remember and but do you if you go back and watch that 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 play and Phil, we pointed this out at the time. Hawkinson was available. Uh, it was, if I'm not mistaken, fourth and 17. But the depth of the Hawkinson route was deeper. And so I think Kirk got more afraid by that, and then he threw the ball to uh, to Jefferson. The fact that we had gotten to a stage where O'Connell, as he said in the clip that Dex played to start the show, he said, I want to allow Kirk to play free. Kirk is not capable of playing free. Kirk is capable of playing within the parameters of what you tell Kirk. So this is actually, this is allowing Frankenstein to operate by himself, which we all know has terrible consequences. Yeah. Terrible consequences. So this, yeah, this whole thing was screwed up. But um, if you go back and watch th that play, the throw is KJ. Over the top. And you so got to make that throw. And it might, and guess what? It might be an incompletion, but as Declan said, I'd far rather go down swinging right. on that than I would with a three- Three yards. He didn't get seven. Dude. He didn't get six. He got three and also, yards. It's like, in there. Well, but what if he breaks a tackle? First of all, the route is taking him to the sideline. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the defender yeah, in that situation, unless you think a Minneapolis miracle situation is about to happen again, where like the defender just goes blue screen of death and dives, you know, for his legs, the defender would just usher him out of bounds, which is pretty yeah. much what happened, right? You would just, okay, just leverage him out of bounds. It's that play, that route should should only be there for one or for two reasons i guess they forgot to cover him or they neglected to cover him therefore you throw it to him and he runs for a first down or it's there to pull a defender away from one of the other routes so that there's a clearance right yes and one more thought on this because I, I keep going back to you, you know me macadac loves himself from some pro football focus right they do largely do a great job evaluating and contextualizing things that the average fan can't really see on game day. Guard play, linebacker play, all sorts of things, right? But when I have a PFF game analyst chiming in and saying, well, burp, burp, beep, burp, 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 the read was right side of the field, as if it's like a computerized breakdown here, right? Well, the ball is snapped, right? You go through your progressions from right to left after ball is snapped. Uh-oh, Heat Jefferson is covered. That's the, that might be the science of it, right? But there is an art that needs to be applied to this starting pre-snap. Okay. And again, I've never played freaking quarterback, so who am I, right? But it's just my opinion. The artistic great quarterbacks get up to the line of scrimmage. They know what the route concepts are here. Okay. So uh, I've got Dalvin as a bailout. But Dalvin, is, Dalvin on that play is really there as a protector, and he leaks out kind of late. So Dalvin's not, Dalvin's not, unless you get insane protection, right? Yep. Dalvin's like your fourth read if you get if you get that far. So there's really four options. There's Thielen up to the left, man coverage. There's KJ coming across. There's Justin Jefferson bracketed with a safety rolling over the top. And then there's TJ Hawkinson underneath to the right. Mm -hmm. Underneath to the right is a non-option before the ball is snapped, unless he's wide open, right? The season's on the line. Like that is a non-option. So if you if the play starts and you know about the whole game, they've been rolling coverage to Jefferson. So again, this is me playing Monday morning quarterback here, but this is the job. You are paid thirty-five million dollars to dissect this stuff before the snap, and so I think the criticism is warranted. If you of the five concepts, two of them are checkdown bailouts. They're basically non-options, right? So to me, it's if you if you're starting with Justin Jefferson. First of all, he's never really covered. But if you determine that he's covered because they're rolling, it shouldn't be a shock to you that, oh, my God, the ball is snapped and they're rolling defenders over there. Shouldn't you anticipate that? Shouldn't KJ maybe be your number one on that play if you've thought through it critically before the snap? Okay, two routes short of the sticks, probably not options. Justin Jefferson, they've been bracketing him all day and rolling a safety. Who's likely to flash open here? KJ, right? Am I being unreasonable? He's no, but paid $35 million no. dollars to do this it's it's a hard job right but that can't be the result with your season on the line you're not being unreasonable if the quarterback was a star but kirk cousins so let, let's go back to the play that in my opinion a, affected it because you got to remember kirk's problems are usually all of the mental variety and kirk is always in kirk's head um kirk talked about the fact that the real play to, to him he tried to uh, it, 
he tried to say the real play was the third down pass that he threw to Osborne, which was broken up and which he said he admitted was um, just a tad too much on Osborne's body. So instead of being that he, he could get his hands out, and make the catch and take off, he was trying to catch the ball inward and it got yeah. broken up. And Kirk's whole thing was, you know, that was my bad throw. So the reality is this. Again, it's the perfect storm. If Kirk Cousins has a failed pass to KJ, and now he's put in a situation where he's like, okay, I screwed one up last time, and TJ Hawkinson is allowed to be standing right there, and he's like, I can throw to Hawk, I can throw to Hawk. Like he was literally I'll, hunting. I'll just, I'll just put he it was on hunting. Him. He you was. Finish, but, you finished the group project. Kevin allowed him because of where Hawk was. Kevin allowed him to hunt for completions. Like, like you talked about all year, Phil, hunting downfield, right? It's time to hunt downfield. You got to go downfield. Well, fourth and eight, you got to at least go with nine yards. Um, Kirk Cousins essentially saw a chance to complete a pass. And by yeah. that point, he was so in his head. But this gets to the conversation of, can Kirk Cousins get you to a Super Bowl? And I've always said, I don't think so. That's why. It's, it's that at the absence of critical thinking and again, I understand how hard that job. Actually, I probably don't even understand how hard that job is unless you've done it. But it's it's an impossible sports job in some ways. But he's one of the guys being paid to do it. And so if in those moments, it's football crisis, your season's on the line, you football need crisis. to be thinking and playing with a clear mind, as Kevin O'Connell said back in January, right? Yep. Yep. If you can't be trusted to at least give your team a chance. No one, by the way, no one is saying that there were great options on the field. The Vikings were likely losing the game at that point because of the position the defense put them in, as as Judd talked about. But in a moment like that, go through a list of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. The guys who also make that kind of money relative to the salary cap. Or even the guys that don't, like the Joe Burrows. How many of them have their season end going out on a punch that basically grazes the defender's ear, right? Like, you, go down swinging, dude. And that's and, the, and that brings it back, Judd. Like, can you tr – all the good things that he did all season long, if that is what happens in the highest leverage spot with all the chips on the table and, and critical thinking goes out the window, I just – I don't know, man. I don't know. So I guess that's my hottest take that he he undid because we're having this conversation about can a Kirk Cousins team? Can a Kirk Cousins team? No. The eight fourth quarter comebacks were great, but all right, Dex, what's your hottest Vikings take? All right, so I'm kinda kinda gonna combine both of your takes a little bit into the my my take that I drew up last night. And it's this. The two thousand twenty two Vikings sabotage the best chance Kirk Cousins will ever have of winning a Super Bowl. Even looking into the future, huh? Yes. I think this was the mm. best possible chance. And by the way, Kirk Cousins still falls into that a little bit because he threw the damn check down. But the defense being as poor as it was, the path to having a really, uh, to having potentially multiple playoff games if you wanted to, but also um, you had a home playoff game against a team that you should have beaten that you were favored against. You had a head coach who kind of unlocked some things, but then just continued to allow a defensive coordinator to be employed and didn't really ever change his scheme, didn't challenge him to be better. You won 13 games. You, Kirk was able to change a lot of his narratives, and it kind of looked like, all right, this will be, if there's if it's ever going to happen, it's going to be right now with a star wide receiver who's having the best year in franchise history. You made a big in-season trade for a tight end to help prop up your offense. I know losing Brian O'Neill stinks, but you had two established offensive tackles. Um, everything was going your way. You had a lot of breaks go your way. And regression on this team is 100% going to happen from a record perspective and maybe from other things that we're probably overlooking too. So when I look up and down here, and I think that the Vikings literally had their best chance to probably do it with Kirk Cousins, it was this year. When you win 13 games, yeah. you host a playoff game, and who knows what happens in the divisional round. Maybe something quick, wacky happens where you can go back and maybe host an NFC title game if you wanted to, if, if things break your way. Instead... They sabotage what probably was the best chance Kirk Cousins will ever have to win a Super Bowl. That's my honest take. 
I think we got Judd back here. Yeah, Internet yeah. Gremlins getting you on a Monday you, here. My fault. My fault. No, no, no. I. Oh no, you used the wrong Netflix browser. I used the wrong browser. Yeah, yeah okay. you know what? Oh, I got to be more. Rookie kind. mistake. I'd like to apologize. Rook, no, you know what? Old man mistake. <laughs> Old man mistake. Let's be honest. Let's. Um, but I did hear the end of Dex's stuff. Yeah. Opinion. Well, yeah. I think you know what's funny. At one point during that game, when the defense was doing the defense thing, which is just be terrible. I love how Ed Donatel too during the week said. I think you're going to like the veterans are taking over this week. I think you're going to like the way we play. Dude, that was one of the biggest fart noise duds we've seen all season in a season full of them. Yep. Um, but at one point I was thinking to myself, you know what? Mid third quarter, Kirk Cousins deserves better than this. He's done a pretty damn good job this season. And he's keeping the Vikings in this game. He's standing in there against the Wink Martindale blitzes. He deserves better than this putrid defensive performance. And he, and he did. He deserved, I think he deserved, you know, why can't you hold him to 24 points or something? Give the offense a real chance. But then when Kirk made that decision on fourth and eight, to me, it's like, I'm now I'm lumping all of them together. They're all, they all deserve each other in the, in the blame game after that loss. But yeah, to the, to the greater point of, is this to this point, the best chance cousins had to win a Super Bowl? I think it's yes, but the more I think about like the 2018 and 19 teams that had badass defenses, especially the 2018 team, they were number one in 2017 defensively. They were still a top five defense in 2018. Well, but uh, John Filippo was clueless and Zimmer's offense. Well, yeah, but they thought they were signing sort of a ready-made star quarterback, and he just wasn't in 2008. He wasn't. He's better now than he was in 2018. So I think we kind of we kind of overlooked the first couple years of his Vikings career. Those were great opportunities, and he just came up woefully short uh, from a quarterback perspective. Going forward, man, he's going to be that, 35. Yeah. I think that's where I'm at, too. It's compounding the other years he had good defenses here and couldn't get it done. And then when I see what he did this year, I think this was the best chance. And now you're kind of now back at zero and you're back at the same question we've always had about Kirk Cousins before the season started. That's very fair. I, I do think, though, that the one thing I, I don't get about it is, you know, you had a chance in November to make a coordinator change. You had a chance. You had plenty of chances. Like it, how you got to that game and we're like, well, that's easy. Ed. another bad performance. And that's what I don't understand. Like, when you're in route to 13 wins, you got something, Dex, to your point, something special. And you, you can be like, well, there were frauds the whole time, but you're not going to consistently win 13 games. And to sort of take that opportunity and to, and to have a defense that you know is just spectacularly underperforming, there's no way that the components of that defense were really that bad. And to have them just underperform, underperform, and just to sort of roll with the punches, well, Ed's my guy. Um, to expand on what you said, Declan, I think it's the whole team. Like, I think they cost a lot of guys a real chance, perhaps mm -hmm. for the last time in their careers, yeah. to make at least a playoff run uh, by saying, well, we'll get, we'll get it corrected. And because every time they got the defense sort of corrected and tweaked, it then almost immediately went back to what it was. So that's what gets me is like, you did, um, you did basically flush away an opportunity that comes with 13 wins by never really correcting a unit that clearly was inferior for way too long. How about this crazy stat from OptaStats? Mm -hmm. I don't really know what OptaStats is, but we'll, Sounds we'll, good trust, though, we'll it? trust them. Yes, Sounds is, trustworthy to me. Sounds good. The Vikings are the only team in the Super Bowl era to complete at least 80% of their passes in a game with no turnovers and no sacks allowed and still lose in the regular season or postseason. Oh, opposite. NFL teams had been 47 and 0 in the Super Bowl era when doing all of those things in a game until yesterday. Very fitting end so, to a strange Viking season. So you said since 1970, since yes. the merger? Oh my yes. god. 47 is... teams before yesterday had completed 80% of their passes, no turnovers, no sacks. All 47 had won that game until yeah. yesterday. I mean, that's alarming, but if you think about it. And the pr the protection was actually, like, pretty on point yesterday, too, considering Bradbury's back. And, you know, there's going to be some moments where you get he pressured wasn't and whatnot. He, but. 
he and and for the most part until he sort of freaked out at the end there you know kirk did a pretty good job of again taking hits but delivering the ball before he took the hit yeah so oh we may need to put a a disclaimer on purple daily here going forward all right christopher chimes in here on twitter oh shut the bleep up already you bleep uh you fat bleep phil Every, <laughs> every, oh my God, it's That's aggressive. Nice. Everybody is a Monday morning quarterback acting like they could easily make these plays in the heat of a game. Good God, no chance I'm watching Purple Daily this offseason. It's going to be nothing but Kirk bashing once again. Bashing. What, what do people need to know about, about us if they're maybe new? Our loyalty isn't to protecting players. Kirk, Kirk, Kirk Cousins made an unforgivable decision a f- from a football standpoint, unforgivable on fourth and eight. He deserves criticism for that. And now because he's turning 35 going into last year of his contract, there's going to be a lot of discussions on this show about the future of the quarterback position. So just disclaimer, if that triggers you, if you'd rather him, if you'd rather us bow down to Kirk for the next eight months and run it back, uh, I don't know that this show is going to be for you, Christopher. We're also criticizing O'Connell, who deserves it. We're also filleting a defense that was terrible. Like, there's no loyalty to players here. We don't... The the whole... The players wear the laundry that eventually, hopefully, carries the Lombardi. So we're not going to sit here and defend players in particular. I I think that there's a bunch of guys that should be gone. Um, So if you are a Adam... Thielen fan, guess what? You ain't going to like me. You see what his wife posted on Instagram last oh, night? Oh, no. What'd she do? Let me find it here. Oh, uh, no. She said, oh, man. I'm going to have to paraphrase because I can't find the exact quote. She basically it was a picture of, of her and Adam, and she essentially said, this may be the end of our time in Minnesota kind of a thing. She referred to it, it's possible that it could be the end of our time in Minnesota. How can we make that work? <laughs> How could you help pack the bag? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, from a salary cap standpoint, it's <laughs> yeah. difficult. I mean, it yes, is, I would. He'd have well, to almost, you can he, live would he, here. Could he retire? I don't think he's going to retire. No, because they'll they'll absorb the cap hit. If, if he retires, they have to eat all of it? Yeah, they'll absorb that cap hit. But, I mean, they don't have to move. No, they'll, they can they'll, stay they'll in their house. still live in Minnesota. Is my they guess. can stay in their house. This might be the end of your time with the Vikings, which is a natural course well, of action. Well, she said in Minnesota. She specifically well, if they said move, if they want to move out of the state, that's not my, you know what? I can't control that. To me, that means that he's going to stay in the NFL, but she's she's saying essentially like, oh, but it probably won't be with the Vikings. Well, if the Vikings can find a way to make that, that work contractually, that's not as painful as what we think, way to go crazy. They might have to make it work, even if it's painful, because he's well, just. Well, I'd love like to get he's... rid of that. I, I, I think they need to move on. I think they need to move on from him. I think Cook. Um, by the way, just quick complaint: Alexander Madison got zero carries on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. I they were riding or dying with their O'Connell didn't have a good top day. guys. I guess like let's just call a spade a spade. Kevin O'Connell did not have a good day. Uh, for this guy who called me a fat bleep on it, Twitter, maybe I should explore Olivia. Olivia Wake controls centers. You know, I've been talking about him for a long time. Phil, you know what? In fact, look at the guy on the left. And now I'm going to present to you the opportunity to look like the guy on the right. And man, is that a good looking cat? Phil Mackey, you too. You too can drop weight. 40 pounds for me. I got help. I dropped the weight. And the best part is, my friends at L- Livia helped me keep the weight off because, Phil, it's not a quick fix. And you don't want a quick fix. You don't want to drop. 40 pounds and gain that weight back. You want a program that's going to work. And right now, Phil, if you go to eight five or L I V E A Livia.com, you tell them I want the Judd offer, the sports dad score North Judd offer. You're going to get 50% off. And then this cat can't call you a fat cat because you're going to be skinny. Eight five five go Livia Livia L I V E A dot com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to lose that weight so you're feeling good by spring. Any fat cats on Underdog this weekend? A lot of fat cats. A lot of fat cats on Underdog. I got I saw a lot of slips coming through. Let's shout out Jordan's here. He actually, uh, man, he looks like a genius for this one. He took over on receptions for Isaiah Hodgins, which ended up having a big day. Uh, eight over the four. 
He took the over on TJ Hawkinson, who was uh, only at four and a half. He finishes with 10. And of course, when you're facing Ed Donatel's defense, you always hammer the over on passing yards, and Danny Jones gets 301. So a nice little three-item pick em parlay here for our, our guy Jordan at Underdog Fantasy. The best and easiest way to play fantasy sports. you still got plenty of playoff football options. The PGA Tour is heating up. Can't wait for that as well. There's NHL, there's NBA. There's plenty of options at Underdog Fantasy when you join with promo code SCORE, S-K-O-R. They'll match your first deposit up to 100 bucks. Go download the Underdog Fantasy app. This morning, Maya Mackey followed me down the steps uh, a little earlier than expected because she demands her Nutrisource chicken and rice. Just <laughs> loves Nutrisource. Yesterday during the game, you know, we got our little game snack. She's got her little her little uh, Nutrisource training treats. It was a football party yesterday. Nutrisource is the official dog food of Purple Daily and Mackey and Judd. Judd. And that and and Stell's right there. Guess what? She. Woke me up at 4.50 this morning. She woke me up at 4.50, and I said, Stella, I love what? you, but you are not going to get your breakfast quite yet. But yet she went outside, came in, and got one of those, a, a training rewards treat because Nutrisource, Stella loves it. And at about 12 years old, guess what? It's keeping her healthy, too, which is fantastic. So, in other words, Stella's happy, Pop Pop, happy as well. Nutrisource works. NutrisourcePetFoods.com to find a Nutrisource retailer near your NutrisourcePetFoods.com. All right, it's time for uh, Chef Declan to now on Mackey and rocking. This chart makes it as clear as I can to you. The pie chart of blame. You want to blame somebody? All right, this is uh, the final, at least game-related pie chart mm-hmm. of the 2022 season. Here, a loss to the New York Giants. Dex, how did you yeah. cut them up? Yeah, this is the this is the final bar crawl of the season, if you will. This is this is the last stop on the uh, what eighteen game, nineteen game, whatever season pie chart we've done this this, this year, and uh, I'm glad to be the last stop on this bar crawl. Uh, boys, just four pieces of pie, just four pieces of pie on the on this pie chart here. Okay, it's a little a little nightcap drink, as old Dex Sweets experienced this weekend as well. It's a little nightcap pie chart of uh, blame to wrap up the regular season. First slice, ten percent. 10% to the quarterback, Kirk Cousins. 10% to Kirk. And the 10% all on one play, the final play of the game. Hmm. The final play of the game. He was brilliant yesterday. And unfortunately, one sour play brings us right back to where we just started, which we just had a spirited discussion and debate on, because that's who Kirk Cousins is. He decides to check down with the season on the line, and it washes away so much good that he was able to accomplish this season. So much good he did yesterday. And I know the Vikings are the first team, as we just pointed out, to lose a game when completing X amount of passes. But still, that's Kirk Cousins, man. Like, he had a chance to wipe away a lot of these narratives. And one bad decision ends the Vikings season, essentially. And he does deserve blame for that. So I will give him a slice. It'll be a small slice, but it's 10%. You know what's funny? I actually disagree with this. I actually, because I, I, I don't think he's to blame at all for them losing the game. I agree with everything we've discussed about the fourth and eight play that, like, you have to make a better decision there. But I think there's, as we've talked about all year, there's this line between blaming and solutions. And if this was a pie chart of solutions, <laughs> I think he would actually, for the first 90% of the game, be the biggest slice. That he is, okay. Yeah. All right, we're uh, you know halfway through the fourth quarter. What's the biggest reason why the Vikings are in this game? I would say Kirk Cousins gets the biggest chunk of the pie chart of solutions. Um, but if you were divvying up the pie chart of solutions toward the end of the game, he would get very little because the last two drives were just nothing. It was just it was duds. So I, I don't think I don't think you can put blame. I'm not gonna like die on a hill and fight you on this, but I don't think he's to blame for the loss but I don't think he was the solution in a moment where you needed him to be the solution, if that makes sense. I think 10% is fair, though. Okay. I, th- I think t- the ultimate um, implosion of something that had worked all season long between O'Connell and Cousins, yeah, 10% is fair. I mean, albeit it's four pieces, but it's 10% of a 100% pie chart of why you lost. It's not the biggest. It's it's a small slice. That's it's a fair. small, small slice. Oh, I, I'm serving it to him. In fact, yeah. I'm smashing his face. <laughs> yeah. Eat this pie. This Livia pie. Eat it. Um, <laughs> the Rock knows how you feel about pie. Second chunk. 
to plotting defenders. Yes. I'm, and, and Ed Donatel does not fall into this. I'm just saying plotting defenders. I'm talking about Boodle. Eric Kendricks, the Darius Smith, then Jordan Hicks and Eric Kendricks. They can't keep up. It's a whole thing, dude. And <laughs> and look, I know that this this shell defense, this Donna shell defense did not work. But man, he got some really pieces of crap in, in, in this car to try to drive, man. I mean, there was a lot of things that were wrong in the car. They tried to drive the car into the ground. And man, they had to push that thing in neutral because it got stuck, essentially. And everyone else was passing them along the way. So the defenders definitely deserve blame. Donatello is going to be on this pie chart. A spoiler alert. I bet, bet you're shocked by that. However, plotting defenders, these old defenders. I mean, there was next to no pass rush yesterday. There was no spy on Daniel Jones. Plotting defenders, 20% of the pie chart to blame. And yeah. why were they all allowed to keep playing throughout the course of the season? That's my question. Like, jo did Jordan Hicks do anything that was so special? You're like, well, we can't take him off the field. Like, no. here. Harrison Smith, I sort of get. Veteran guy, for the most part, aside from a couple plays on Sunday, you know, he knows what he's doing. He doesn't look stupid ever. But, you know, Jordan Hicks. Um, Zadarius Smith, clearly, after he hurt the knee against Buffalo, was a shell of the guy that we saw for the first X amount of games. And they were just all sort of allowed to keep playing. Hey, are you available? Like when pre-concussion yesterday, when Brian Asamoah didn't sniff the field, I don't think he did. I, I don't recall seeing him when he had played 27 snaps in the previous game against Daniel Jones and the Giants, it's like, well, our Clydesdales, they're still good. Yeah. It's like, no, no they can't run. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I mean, they have ha half of their starting defense is over the age of 30 in a league where it, it I feel like it keeps getting younger and younger. Yes. Look at the, 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 the list of quarterbacks, franchise quarterbacks under the age of like 26 right now. It's insane, and their so quarterbacks are more mobile. I feel like the receiving pool, it's just, like, exploded in popularity among young kids. A lot of kids who used to play baseball or other sports, they want to be a wide receiver because you can make $20 million. It's a glamorous position. And so there's just more guys like Jefferson and Tyree Kill and Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddell and all these dudes coming in the league and tight ends that are crazy athletic and – Man, once you hit 28, 29, 30 years old, your straight line speed has been declining. And that's kind of like the Vikings right now. Eric Kendricks, Patrick Peterson, Jordan Hicks, Zadarius Smith, Harrison Smith. I just, that's five dudes, 30 to 34 years old as the anchors of your defense. If you just get rid of a huge chunk of them and replace them with faster, more spry players that maybe don't know what they're doing as much, could it really be that much worse? Than 31st well, in yardage allowed? And it's your job to coach those guys up. It's your job to coach them up so that they're not, so that they don't look like fools. And and I don't know what his PFF grade will ultimately be, but you know the guy that they attacked at times on Sunday and it was actually very smart? Patrick, Patrick Peterson. Peterson. Yeah. Yep. They went after him. Um, and again, you know, Phil, to your point, he's an older dude and, and he can be attacked. So, yeah, Dex, you're exactly right. Plotting people is not a good thing in football. Mm -mm. The Rock knows how you feel about pie. Second piece of pie, uh, third piece of pie, excuse me, third piece of pie in this four uh, pie chart of blame. 30%, 30% to the head coach, Kevin O'Connell. 30% to KOC. Um, when you lose a game like this, a lot of stuff has to fall on coaching. We talked a lot about Judd and his hottest take, that he empowered Donatel. There was no changes ever to be made. He just said, fix it. And here's some things I would do to scheme against it at one point. And some of those things may have worked in a short-term burst. But he employed this defender. This falls on the head coach. Um, going back to the game, even. So, classic KOC Kirk drive. Opening drive. Great opening script. You get six. You get you get up. And then after that, after you score a touchdown, you run eight plays, essentially, before you get the ball back with three minutes in the second quarter. And the decision to throw a wide receiver pass. Selfishly, Dex tweets would have loved a write-that-down point. But... The football fan in me was infuriated that we made a decision to throw from Jeff Justin Jefferson and then back to Kirk Cousins thinking that would work. We have so much <laughs> evidence now. How would I would do that play. <laughs> I, I, I called I called this out midway through the season and I even got some clap back. Well, you don't know some of the shots that could be made. This guy, Kevin O'Connell, is a buffoon on short yardage to go situations, dude. He out thinks himself. We have plenty of examples there. That play alone is 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 is, is an issue. So, Kevin O'Connell, 
He deserves he deserves a piece of pie here, and it's a thirty percent chunk. So just quickly on that on that play, O'Connell was asked uh, a ton about it in his post game, and Kirk was asked as well. It sounds like it was I think it was supposed to be Cousins. And by the way, I'm not defending it, Dex. You are correct. It was supposed to be Cousins to Jefferson, and I think what it was was I think Cousins was supposed to hang back, and it was supposed to be a lateral back, and then Jefferson was supposed to be open. So you're right, like the amount of ifs. And then he was supposed to be this, and then he was supposed to be that. Yes, it was yeah. one of the dumbest play call. You know, now now that might be a great play call in week two. Oh, what the heck? Let's razzle dazzle. But in that situation, these new offensive coaches, young guys, um, they really tend have a tendency to get o- over their skis when like what the play call should be is so obvious. How about a slant? How about well, a power run? How about how something run, else right. that is not the one guy behind this guy to this guy to this guy to quarterback? No, dude, it's two yards. It's two it's, yards. Well, it's funny because we have yeah. been sitting here in fairness, you know, for the last month. Where's the creativity? Where's the, you know, where's the, some of the the motion stuff that you that you saw earlier in the season? But there's got to be a middle ground between running it up the middle behind injured or backup offensive linemen. And yeah. razzle dazzle, throw it over. Kirk Cousins catches it over here. Like, okay. <laughs> well, and and we, we did see the creativity when they went to thirteen personnel on the touchdown pass to Irv. That's what we were talking about. Yeah, like that was a different sort of look. Um, but yeah, you can't the Gi- the Giants in the first half, you guys, and this ended with a field goal, not a touchdown. The Giants had a twenty play drive. They kept the Vikings defense on the field for 20 plays. And on third and one, you're not just trying to get the first down. You're going to dagger them. Like, have a have, – read the room. I do want to ask you guys before we get to the final, and I think obvious slice of pie here, I think. Yep. You guys have slept on this. If they had scored a touchdown on their final drive, and how much time was left? It was like – it was like inside two minutes at that point, right? Or it was around two minutes when the Vikings yeah. – It was around two minutes. Yep. Okay, so it was their last drive. Let's say they score a touchdown, and it winds up being under a minute. Under a minute. So so a lot less time for the Giants to go back down the field. Sure. Would you have gone for two, or would you have kicked an extra point with Greg Joseph to tie it? I would have went for two. Yeah, I would have too. And I, I love Greg. I've been defending him. He was actually great yesterday, but it's, I would have well, went for partially two. Greg, do you trust Greg Joseph, and partially do you trust the defense? You know, right. If you're going to... I guess in, in either case, the defense could uh, could if, if there's 30 seconds left, like could the Giants have worked that clock to get down for a game winning field goal? Yes, but it's more about overtime defense. So, Judd, um, I think O'Connell would have kicked the extra point. I I was thinking when they were driving because shockingly, I thought they're probably going to to score. I I was fairly confident the Vikings were going to win that game until they couldn't. Um, going for two, I think makes a ton of sense. I, I don't think he does it because yeah. he's proven to be more conservative than what I expected. And he definitely coaches with a sort of a gut instinct thing too. Um, but yeah, would I have wanted to subject my defense to being on the field at all? And, and you know what, this was one game you guys where time of possession, which I know can be a completely o- overstated statistic time of possession was the key. Because the, and I think we talked about this on Friday, the absolute most important thing was for both teams, their defenses could not be on the field because they both sunk. Yeah. All right. And the final slice the of pie. Knows how you feel about pie. Yeah. Probably the most obvious chunk of pie on a pie chart of blame or praise we've done all season. 40% to Ed Donatel and the Vikings defense. Uh, Giants versus the Vikings defense yesterday, 31 points, 431 yards, 6.3 yards per game, 7 of 13 on third down. There really wasn't a single thing uh, that that defense did that Ed Donato really dialed up. I think there was one sack, right? Daniel got a big sack on Danny Jones, at, uh, Daniel, Daniel Jones that did force a punt. Outside of that, it was a sieve. There was no adjustments all season. Duke Shelley, great story, but my God, you had like... That, that's the shining moment. We found Duke Shelley as a waiver claim, and he might turn into be a nice little solid cornerback, but that defense was horrendous. It was the biggest reason why they lost. So 40% of the blame to Ed Donatel. So to wrap, 40% to Ed, 30% to Kevin O'Connell, 20% to plotting defenders, 10% to Kirk Cousins. There you go. The Rock knows how you feel about pie. Yeah. All right. Judd, any, would you, I think you got the big players here. 
I love I that mean, you I... put 20% plotting defenders. I mean, how many times did you see Kendricks, Hicks, Peterson trailing eight yards behind somebody, you know? But, like, how much film do you, did you have to watch of Jordan Hicks months ago to be like, okay, you know what? This probably ain't going to work. But, yeah, I probably would have given out more slices, but you definitely hit on, on the, the key ones. But I just like to give out a ton of slices. You do. People, <laughs> and I like people, the small slices. Especially when they fail. I like to give them a lot of credit for failing. You have, like, the sadistic, weird look on your face right now. Yeah, I'm not happy you, about you what happened. Like, no, you look gleefully happy about what happened. No, but I mean that's my smirk. That that means that I am disgusted. Sports day okay. disgusted. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> I'm not gleefully happy. No, I want are you kidding? I wanted them, I thought that they would lose to San Fran, but I wanted them to get there. Because you know what? If nothing else, selfishly, it's good yeah. for us. Well, I think uh yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, it would have been I wanted I did not a run, no, I'm not for gleeful. sure. Absolutely. I I'm think, not gleeful. And just because there's a lot of people that probably discovered our show during the season last year, and we appreciate you if you found us on YouTube or Spotify or Apple or scorenorth.com. However, thank you. But we we wanted this thing to continue, just like all of you, but we love off-season speculation. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that the time period between January and May, even going back to our old radio shows, some of the most fun shows we have and some of the best stuff that we do, just oh, we're biased, obviously, happens between January and the draft. And so we are excited to look ahead immediately. In fact, I'm putting the finishing touches for a bonus episode today on Purple Daily. Defensive coordinator replacement candidates. Let's just, I know that nothing official has happened yet, a retirement or a, or a firing but let's just start talking about some of the names on a bonus episode of who could come in here, help fix this thing, help redesign this thing. Is it a 3-4? Is it a 4-3? I think we should start th that discussion and discussions like it today on Purple Daily. The morning after. Just get after it. The season premiere of Purple Daily, if yeah. you will. The season premiere of your fire. So that's a wrap. Uh a shout out to our friends too at the official sports bar of the Sports Dad, Judd Zolgad. If you want a place to drown your sorrows, or if you want a place for a big group gathering, I was going to say, how about this, you guys? How about this? A big after season fantasy league or Vikings party, Park Tavern, SLP, my neck of the, the woods. Guess what? They can accommodate your group. And I'm not talking about your group of like five or 10. I'm talking about your group of 40 or 50. In fact, if you have, um, I don't know, your wife's birthday is coming up and she's like you know what i want you to plan it and you're like oh my god what do i do i'm going to give you one stop shopping that's going to make you look like a hero and you don't have to tell her that you did almost no work besides pick up your cell phone and dial it park tavern 952-929-6810 parktavern.net they will take care of everything They've got bowling, they've got two bars, they've got plenty of banquet space. So once you call them, guess what? They will set the wheels in motion for you to look like you did a ton of planning when all you did was basically one thing, parktavern.net, a place that has been in the community here in St. Louis Park for more than 42 years, Park Tavern in SLP. It is the place to hang. It is the official sports bar of Sports Dad. And we are the official therapists of Vikingsville. Here on Purple Daily. If you missed Vikings Vent Line yesterday, it's a two-hour therapy session. Hopefully, uh, the stuff we're going to put out today and tomorrow will also be therapeutic. And we will see you on a bonus episode also today looking at defensive coordinator options, assuming they do that. See you guys.